Good day, my name is Andy Bates and I'm an elder here at Arendelle Alliance Church. Welcome to our online service. Before we begin, here are a few announcements. Just a reminder, we are closed on Monday, August 3rd for the civic holiday. We would like to encourage those who are interested in becoming a member of Arendelle Alliance Church to call the church and they will arrange for you to meet with Pastor Joran and discuss the process. We would like to announce that Lorraine Wilms has agreed to be our prayer coordinator for the church. Commitment to prayer is a strong part of Arendelle Alliance Church. If you receive prayer requests through the prayer network, the office has sent you a communication for your input. If you wish to start receiving prayer requests and are interested in participating, we need to hear from you. Please contact Lorraine by email at prayer at arendellealliance.ca and review the e-bulletin for full details. Due to the long weekend, summer fun days this week will be ages for ages three to five. Uh, we'll be meeting on Tuesday, August 4th from one to three p.m. There are four sessions remaining for the month of August. And we will now have you watch a short video from our missionary, Heather Hahn to Cabasis. Nothing is too hard for God. When God touched Jonah's heart, he did a great work through him. It was just this past month that a friend of mine went to do something that she had originally called impossible. There was a place that she did not want to go. You know what that place was? It was the exact town where she grew up in. You see, my friend Sonia grew up in a town where people have very little. And when she was a kid, she said she would never live in poverty and she would always have running water and she would have a good job and she would never be as poor as she was growing up. So when she grew up and went away to study, she never wanted to go back to that town. But she found Jesus. And when Jesus touched her heart, she stopped remembering that village or that town as a dirty place or where life wasn't perfect. She began to remember how beautiful the sunsets were and how brilliant the coffee plants looked in the rain and the sweet sound of the language that the people spoke there because God touched her heart. Just this past month, Sonia went back to her community and we asked her if she would oversee a program where people could get food in a time of much need. So she went to their homes, she heard their stories, she got all their data down, she prayed for them. And according to the need, she made sure that those families got hampers. Nothing is too hard for God. This week, you have the opportunity to give to the Global Advance. This is a way of when we give our money, it enables people like myself to tell Sonia about Jesus so that Sonia can go and tell her people about Jesus in their own language. You also have the opportunity to pray that God would do the same in our community here as he is doing around the world. And that we would be able to go to the places that seem difficult, but with him, nothing is too hard. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that nothing is too hard for you. We praise you that all the things that you give us don't actually belong to us. We can have them in our hands to the hands of others. So we pray that you would use everything that we have, our money, our bike, our food, and as you give it to us, we pray that we would be able to bless other people with it as well. In the name of Jesus, amen. Welcome back. We will now have a time of prayer. Let's pray. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those to look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and deliver him. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you as saints, for those who fear him have no lack. And the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Heavenly Father, you are a holy God who is the true and living God. We confess we are frail, sinful, and wretched. We need your amazing grace for strength, power, and hope. 
Thank you for your saving grace, for adopting us into your family and calling us your children, even though we don't deserve it. Forgive us and cleanse us from our sins of hypocrisy and pride. May we be humble and gracious in every situation we encounter. Thank you for uh, your saving us by grace alone and not of works and justifying us by faith alone, sanctifying us by your word alone so we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ alone. May we give you the deserved glory alone to you and not to anyone else and may your fruit be evident in our lives. Thank you for our country of Canada. Thank you for the summer season. Thank you for the staff here at Arendale who love you and serve you faithfully. Thank you for all the people here at Arendale who use their gifts and talents to serve you. And thank you for keeping us safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for the COVID team who are planning so we can meet safely. Give them wisdom and insight. Uh, we pray for Big River Bible Camp for Jason and Anita. Continue to pray as they upgrade uh, the power as they are putting their power underground. Pray for safety as they dig and uh, work around the power. We pray for them as they try to connect with past staff and campers and try to find creative ways to reach out to them. We pray for the John family in India. We pray for Ben who has had flu-like symptoms with a lot of weakness but is now on the mend. We pray for Susan to be able to travel back to India safely and securely. We pray for the ministry challenges they face, for good internet to reach people, and to find creative ways to teach hundreds of children during the lockdown. We pray for their finances will be sufficient to pay the salaries of all their staff. We think of our District Alliance churches in Milden, Milestone, and Montreal Lake. May the good news, the gospel, be communicated clearly today. We pray for our federal, provincial, and municipal governments at this time as they are trying to manage a country during the pandemic, dealing with the economics and political unrest and lawlessness. We pray for your mercy and grace in our land. We pray for those in our congregation who are in need of, during the pandemic, whether it be loss of job or layoff or uh, daily care, minister to their needs by your gracious hands. We pray for Russ Memory, uh, Krista Hansen, and Jane uh, Slyka and their families with the sudden passing of Cheryl Memory. Comfort them and meet their needs at this time. We pray for Joran as he brings a message. Thank you for the love, his love for you and uh, for his family. Protect them and bless them this day. We pray for those in need who are mentioned in our uh, uh, e-bulletin. We pray that you would meet their needs and uh, if there'd be healing or Whatever needs, we pray that you would meet them. Uh, we commit the rest of the service to you, and we ask these requests in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hello, my friends, and it's time for Kids Talk. So parents, if your children aren't already with you, feel free to pause the video, gather your kids with you, and join us for Kids Talk today. My friends, I would like you to consider and imagine a knight, and he's big, and he's strong, and he's mighty, and he's practiced, and he's trained for many years on how to ride a horse, and to wield a sword, and carry a shield, and ride and face tough things in battle. Now imagine our knight, he's riding his horse into battle, but oh my goodness, he's forgotten his armor. How do you think he's going to do against his most ferocious enemy? Do you think he's going to do well? Do you think he's going to come home alive? I don't think so either. A knight's armor was made out of hard metal, and it covered him from the top of his head down to the tips of his toes, and it was designed to protect him from the weapons of his enemy. Well, do you know that God wants us to be protected as well? And he has given us armor to put on too. Not armor on our bodies, but armor for our spirit. And we can find this armor in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And it says, to put on the whole armor. So not just one piece. God wants us to put on the whole armor of God. Um, so that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And that means our enemy, our greatest enemy that we have, isn't somebody that we can touch or somebody that we can see or feel, but this enemy is Satan. He's the devil, and he's a spiritual person, and we can't see him, and we can't touch him, but he seeks to destroy us at every time, every moment that he can. So when we don't put on our armor, we allow Satan, our enemy, to get into our hearts and into our minds to destroy us. And how does he do that? Well, let's consider my friend Tom. Here he is. So Tom, he was a Christian, and he believed in God, and he had love in his heart for God, but he began to think pretty highly of himself. He became prideful, and he started thinking that he could do things on his own. And he began to take off some of his armor, and he began to listen to his teachers at school when they told him, there's no such thing as God. And so he took off more of his armor. And when his friends began to tease him and say, oh, you're just a goody two-shoes, and they, make fun of, they made fun of poor Tom when um, he would go to church, and he didn't like that. So he tried to fit in, and he took off more of his armor, and more, and bit by bit, until all of his armor was gone. So now he's just like our knight, He's defenseless. He doesn't have any spiritual armor left. And so when the storms of life would come and test him and the enemy would attack him, do you think Tom is going to be able to rise to victory? Or do you think he'll sink to defeat and be defeated? Let's check and see. Oh, Tom didn't take off enough armor. There, Tom, poor Tom, he sank to defeat. He's been defeated by the enemy. And some of us are like Tom. We've taken off our armor, and some of us haven't even put our armor on. So how can we be protected? God wants us to be protected. So God tells us to put on our armor so that we can withstand the schemes of the enemy. So I have another friend, and let's see what he's wearing. This is my friend, Harold. 
and he has his armor on. He has his, on his helmet of salvation. He has on his belt of truth. He has on his breastplate of righteousness and his shoes that are um, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. He has his shield of faith, which withstands the flaming arrows of our enemy. And he carries with him the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that when the enemy, the, when Satan comes and attacks him, he is ready to go. Harold is ready for battle. So when the storms of life come and the enemy attacks him, he is ready to withstand the um, enemy. And so we're going to put him in and see what happens and see if he sinks to defeat or rises to victory. Good luck, Harold. And he rises to victory. And that's what the armor does for us. We rise to victory when we put on that armor each and every day. And how do we do that? Well, we read our Bibles, we pray, we come to church, we listen to our pastor, we listen to our teachers, we listen to our moms and dads, and they all direct us and give us good advice on how to put on our armor. And God protects us when we have on all of those pieces of armor. So my friends, let's pray. And, um, I, well, I want you to remember this week to clothe yourself with the armor of God. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for salvation and thank you for righteousness. Thank you for your word that guides us and protects us. Thank you for truth and peace. Help us to remain strong in our faith. Help us, or thank you for your protection and help us to be continuously victorious over our enemy. Help us to always be prepared for battle, for our enemy is always ready to destroy us. Let our hands and our hearts and our minds serve you with honor, and may everything we do bring you glory. And we pray in the power of Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming and listening today, and we'll see you again next week. Good morning, my name is Emery and I'll be reading with you today Amos chapter 7 from the Christian Standard Bible. The Lord God showed me this. He was forming a swarm of locusts at the time the spring crop first began to sprout, after the cutting of the king's hay. When the locusts finished eating the vegetation of the land, I said, Lord God, please forgive. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? The Lord relented concerning this. It will not happen, he said. The Lord God showed me this. The Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. It consumed the great deep and devoured the land. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? The Lord relented concerning this. This will not happen either, said the Lord God. He showed me this. The Lord was standing there by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said, What do you see, Amos? I replied, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will no longer spare them. Isaac's high places will be deserted, and Israel's sanctuaries will be in ruins. I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you right here in the house of Israel. The land cannot endure all of his words. For Amos has said this, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go away, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, earn your living, and give your prophecies there. But don't ever prophesy at Bethel again, for it's the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. So Amos answered Amaziah, I was not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, rather I was a herdsman and took care of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me out from following the flocks and said to me, Go, prophecy to my people Israel. Now hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself will die in pagan soil, and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. 
It is good morning for those of you watching on our video. It is good evening for those of you who are sitting with us in the sanctuary. For those of you at home, I'm staring out for the very first time at about 40 people. They are scattered throughout the main floor, and I have one couple upstairs watching the video camera. Welcome to COVID service. I... I think we may actually take some photos because what you see is not really what you walk into to stage right. We have a sky lift for some of the work that's going on. There's gyp rock that has just been taped. The front step has just been poured. By the time you're watching this, this wall behind will be painted. The step will be finished. It is amazing how quick things are transforming and changing. There is a rule among pastors, change nothing in your first year. <laughs> That is so unfair. <laughs> I had great plans to come in and do, put nothing new on the table, give us a chance for me to get used to you folks and you to get used to me. And people are walking in, I go, I think that's so-and-so. I've met them a couple of times, but all I'm seeing is eyeballs up because everybody's wearing a mask and they say, don't change anything in the first year and we're doing renos and we're online and God has a sense of humor. I want to consider for a moment, as we go to Amos, we're continuing our sermon series in Amos chapter 6, and as, as we come to the text, I was considering this as the weirdness of COVID and the strange things that we're going through and the way my life typically plays out, and I, I like to think of my life more as a romantic comedy or at least a comedy of some striper, striper variety or, or shape or something, uh, but I, I think about some of those really fun moments, a uh, phrase you never want to hear from a young guy, I think it's a good idea if, especially if it's late at night in the dorms, I think of some of the things that we've done, how hard can it be? I'm a big Top Gear fan. Those words usually instill fear. As I was getting ready for tonight, I was thinking one of those great moments where reality comes crashing down on someone and the reality they think they're in for, they were a little shocked by. I follow cycling. I'm, I'm, I think most people know I'm into cycling. A number of years ago here in Saskatchewan, there was a competition being held and they're being shepherded around by a, some kind of convertible sports car. I don't know what the deal was and the race officials were in the car and they had a first time driver who had never been involved in a bike race before. And this guy's driving around and I think probably voice and head was how hard can it be and what they expected of reality. They thought, I mean, they're, they're on bicycles, like what's the big deal? And my friend reported it to me afterwards and I don't know if they could hear it over race radio or, or how it came out, but the driver was there and typically they're running radio so everybody knows what's being said in the car. All of a sudden there is just this, oh no. No one told the driver that cyclists will do upwards of 70 kilometers an hour in the finishing sprint. And his reality came crashing in as he's just kind of toodling along. He says, they're cyclists, how fast are they going to go? He looks in this rear view mirror and there are 70 guys bearing down on him at top speed, some of them not even looking where they're going, which is a, you, know, you don't do this in cycling, but it happens all the time. And now and again, guys get killed because their head's down, they hit a stationary object. It's terrible. The driver looks up in the mirror, all he sees is 70 guys doing 70 kilometers an hour surging. And, and my buddy said, all you then hear is the sound of the sports car engine. And, and it peeled out at like 40, he was doing about 45K an hour and he actually peeled out to try and keep from. Reality as he thought it was and what he got did not line up. And this is Israel. This is also college students. I remember my first college classes, I handing in my first paper and coming out of high school and thinking, I think I know the way, the, I had no idea how the world worked. Isn't this marriage? I, I, I remember getting on my honeymoon and thinking, it's going to be awesome. And then you get on, it's like, I didn't know it was going to be like this. This is not what I expected. And it's not bad, it's just what we thought we are getting isn't always what we get. In Israel's case, it is bad. Wow, I just had a flashback to the day we brought Michael home from the hospital. It was 36 degrees, 37 degrees. It's the 22nd of August, 23rd of August. We're brand new parents. We bring this screaming nine pound boy home. We had company, they'd just driven from Ontario to see us. And it was awesome, we were so thankful they're there, but he screamed, I actually slept him in a laundry basket. We just didn't know what to do. We made him a bed in the laundry basket, put him next to the bed. It's like, we'll figure this out tomorrow. And I'll be honest, about three in the morning, all I could think is, what have I done? 
He's going to be 20 next month. What have I done? With this in mind, would you bow with me in prayer as we go to Amos chapter 6 where reality and what we hope is reality is not going to line up with what we're actually going to get. Let's pray. Holy God, would you come and would you meet us? Holy Spirit, would you guide us into all truth wherever we are, whether it's Wednesday night or the following Sunday, whether we're at home or we're traveling, we're listening in a vehicle or we're watching. Holy God, would you meet us? Holy Spirit, would you guide us? Would you speak to our hearts, and as we look at your word, would you reveal yourself, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're in our third of four sermons in the book of Amos. And Amos has been a bit of a downer to this point, because God comes and he starts with those nations surrounding, and for three and for four, some translations have it crimes, some translations have it sins, and he begins to nail those surrounding nations for common human decency things, and then especially last week, look, we looked at how Israel primarily those northern ten tribes, they had stopped treating each other properly, they stopped worshiping God properly, and God comes and says, I'm going to punish you. You knew better, you have not listened, you have not obeyed, you have not fulfilled the covenant, and this is where we pick it up. 6 verse 1, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the hill of Samaria, the notable people in this first of nations, those the house of Israel comes to. Woe. There is a sense in Amos' message as we move into chapter 6 where he's talking a little bit to Judah, the southern tribes, hence the reference to Zion. But really, it's the northern tribes. They're headquartered at Samaria. God comes and says, woe to you. And confronts them. And we've already had the, the litany, the, the, this laundry list of sins. You have mistreated one another. The... the Powerful and the rich have oppressed the poor. You've not worshipped me properly. You've not brought proper offerings. And God has said, I am coming to punish you. And we struggle actually in the first five chapters of Amos. There's hint of the mercy and grace of God because he's saying something to them. And we hope, we hope that maybe if there's repentance, there'll be forgiveness. And if there is punishment, there'll be restoration. Woe to those who are at ease. What they think life is supposed to work like is not what life is supposed to work like. What they're anticipating they're getting is not what they're going to get. And I kind of feel as I read this text, like this is my life and maybe your life where I've gone into a situation and I kind of think it might be more challenging than I think it is or maybe the situation is worse than I think it is, but I hope I'm wrong and until I know it's worse, I'm just going to be happy. For me, that was when my daughter was diagnosed with leukemia and I still remember getting sent to Saskatoon. I was so angry. They sent me to Saskatoon. It was... 9.30 on a Thursday night, she had an infection in her knee. Why are you sending us to Saskatoon? And as things began to progress, you start to get those little hints of, okay, maybe my view of reality isn't quite right. And that's what Amos is doing to the Israelites. Woe to you. You think things are okay. They're not okay. Verse 4, you lie on your beds inlaid with ivory, sprawling out on the couches. Dine on the lambs from the flock and the calves from the stalls. And he goes on and he describes how they're pretending like everything is okay. They are committed to this idea that their comfort and their complacency can continue. That, you know, maybe God's going to overlook them. He said things in the past, but nothing has happened. It reminds me of being a kid and your parents warn you. We will punish you. And you push it a little bit, nothing happens. So you push it a little bit more, and then you snap the elastic. And then death comes quickly. I'm speaking metaphorically. Therefore, they will now go into exile, verse 7, as the first of captives. And the feasting of those who sprawl out will come to an end. The reality they think they're in for is not the reality that they're going to get. Those who are most complacent, those who are most comfortable, those who are taking the, the easy path are the ones who are going to be led first. Interestingly, both with the southern tribes and with the northern tribes, when they are overthrown, particularly with the southern tribes, the first people that go are the wealthy, are the powerful, are the influential. They're the first ones to go. The ones who are most comfortable are the first to find themselves in exile. The word of the Lord. It continues. 
If there are ten men left in a house, they will die. A close relative and burner will remove his corpse from the house. He will call to someone in the inner recesses of the house, any more with you? And the person will reply, none. Then he will say, silence, because the Lord's name must not be invoked. And it's tragic because in this very statement, there is this confession as they will do this. Don't invoke the Lord's name. They realize the wrath of God. There's kind of this implicit idea here. They know they're in sin, but they're doing nothing about it. They've hardened their hearts, and they've turned their back on God. Chapter 6 is a condemnation of their selfishness, their comfort, their complacency. There's no concern for themselves or for anyone else. Reminds me a little bit of what Paul says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He quotes this to the Corinthians. There's kind of that fatalism attitude almost, and kind of connected to this idea, well, God hasn't done anything so far, so maybe he won't do anything ever. And they're in for a very shocking time. In the case of the northern tribes, when the the Assyrians finally invade in 721, they will cart them off. And hear this. The people hearing Amos' message, the the majority of the people that are hearing what it is the prophet of God is saying, when he says, the wrath of God is coming, he is taking you off into captivity, those northern ten tribes, when the Assyrians come, never come home. We still debate to this day, where did the ten lost tribes go? We call them lost. We have no idea what happened to them. They disappear into the mists of history. God removes them. God's going to come to the southern tribes a little more than a century later. He'll remove them as well. In that case, there will be restoration, but it's going to come after 70 years living in exile in Babylon. God warned them. There's covenant people. They know better, and the wrath of God will come. Well, chapter 7 continues this. Chapter 7, there's a huge shift that happens in the text. Because up until this point, it's been the word of the Lord came to me. And Amos tells us what he sees. And it's very typical of what we would read, say, in Isaiah or one of the other prophets. But notice the first three verses of chapter 7. The Lord God showed me this. He was forming a swarm of locusts about the time of the spring crop. When it first began to sprout. After the cutting of the king's hay. When the locusts finished eating the vegetation of the land, I said, Lord God, please forgive. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? And the Lord relented concerning this. It will not happen, he said. Suddenly, Amos is a participant in his own vision. And I love it when the prophet's invited in to talk to God. And it reminds me of a few different places. It reminds me of Abraham. When he's pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah, unfortunately, Abraham... His, his faith in Sodom and Gomorrah was greater than what was warranted when he was negotiating with God. Well, what if you find 25 righteous or 20 righteous? And he should have stopped maybe at one. Um, I think Lot would have been found righteous. Amos is now invited to be a participant just as God does with Moses. God shows him, I'm going to send the locusts right after the spring has kind of hit. The crops beginning to sprout. The optimal time to do the most damage. I'm not a farmer, but I've lived in Saskatchewan for a long time. I've got friends who are farmers. And I've watched what hail, for example, does. And it comes in strips. I remember driving around uh, Rosetown a number of years ago. They had a locust swarm. It wasn't locusts. We called grasshoppers over here. They're smaller, which is frightening because you think how much damage they do. And, And it was incredible. My... Our grill, we couldn't get them out of the grill of the car, and the road was almost slick from these grasshoppers. And it came through, and talking to my friends around Rosetown, the damage it did on the crops was spectacular. I saw something similar when I was a port kid back in the 80s. Karen Port, we had a surge of grasshoppers that came through and destroyed everything. Well, the prophecy God gives to Amos, I'm going to send the swarm of locusts. It's going to come just as everything is coming into its optimal growing season, it's going to strip everything bare. And Amos understands what this means. If this prophecy comes true, Jacob dies. There will be no food. They will starve to death. And I love Amos' response. He pleads with God on behalf of Israel. Jacob is so small. 
How will he survive? And notice God's response. He relents. Well, a second time in chapter 7, God comes to Amos. Verse 4. The Lord showed me this. The Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. It consumed the great deep and devoured the land. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? The Lord relented concerning this. This will not happen either, said the Lord God. Well, this time it reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah. I've already referenced them this morning. Fire coming down. Both with the grasshoppers, they will, or the locusts, they will come, they will eat everything. Jacob will starve. This one, I'll just send fire. We're going to burn everything, destroy it. As Sodom was destroyed for its sin, so Israel will be destroyed. Amos intercedes. God relents. Third time, the story continues. Verse 7. He showed me this. The Lord was standing there by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said, what do you see, Amos? I replied, a plumb line. The Lord said, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will no longer spare them. Isaac's high places will be deserted. Israel's sanctuaries will be left in ruins. I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. And the story will move on from there because this third time, there's no record that Amos interceded. I would suggest that the reason there's no record of it is that the intercession is not successful. Either he doesn't intercede because he realizes the finality of God's judgment or he does intercede and God says no. This will come to pass. Israel has been measured and has been found to be wrong. I love the image of the plumb bob. It reminds me of something Jesus says in John's gospel. I am the way and the truth. And when Jesus says I'm the truth, he gives us that establishment of here's a reference point by which we can know true. And I am no carpenter. Anyone who's seen my construction projects know this, but I understand a plumb bob. It tells us if it's straight or not. We put the plumb to what is Israel. That spiritual evaluation and it will be found to be crooked. They violated the covenant of God. They are in sin. The wrath of God is coming. And while he will not destroy them with a natural disaster, while he will not destroy them by fire, they will go into exile. They have been found to be crooked, metaphorically and literally. And Amos, for all of his intercession, all he really does, in a sense, is he negotiates that they get to go into exile instead of being killed in their land. It's a heavy, heavy message. Well, chapter 7 continues this different kind of spin because now we move to what we would call a narrative, a story. And Amos now lets us into some of what was happening in his day as he now confronts the establishment. Verse 12. Amaziah, who's the priest, he's been talking to the king. He's heard that Amos has been preaching. He's heard that Amos has been preaching bad things. Amaziah now says to Amos, Go away, you seer. Flee to the land of Judah. Earn your living and give your prophecies there. But don't ever prophesy at Bethel again, for it is the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. He tries to send him away because he thinks Amos is just another prophet for hire, and Israel had trouble with this. Pay me money, I'll give you a good prophecy. A little bit like what happens with Balaam. Pay me money, and I will tell you what you want to hear. But that's not the way Amos works. Notice what he says in verse 14. Amos answered Amaziah, I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Amos didn't look for this job. The job found him. It's so true of God, isn't it? He decides, he gifts, he equips, and he asks us to be obedient. Amos is actually a wonderful model of obedience, and I feel bad for him. Here's a man who has not sought a career in the spotlight. He's a farmer. And God said, go. And now he's appearing before kings. Verse 16, now hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore... This is what the Lord says. Your wife will be a prostitute in the city. 
Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword, and your land will be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself will die on a pagan soil, and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. And this last turn, the, the whole reason for this massive change where in the earlier five chapters, six chapters, Amos is speaking on behalf of God, and then chapter seven, we get that really neat inter interlude where Amos and God are talking, Amos is interceding, and now we have this confrontation. Amaziah is Israel, in a sense, symbolically, metaphorically. The attitude, the actions that go away, we don't want to hear the truth go away, we don't believe what you have to say, take your words elsewhere. And their attitude, their view of reality doesn't change what's going to happen. God says, I'm coming to get you. And in fact, the prophecy here specifically to Amaziah will destroy his family while Israel goes into exile. The good news, Amos chapters 8 and 9 are coming because this is not the end of the story. But we are in the middle of a moment where we need to stop and ask, how serious is God about the holiness of his people? I've been pondering this actually quite a bit lately. It's strange living in a city. We have neighbors. And I hear alarms going off, and I hear, we've got a fire station right near our condo, and the McDonald's is just over the way, so depending on the direction of the wind, I can smell the Big Macs and the fries. And, and it's strange, you have something in cities, I think you call them stoplights. I haven't seen those in about two decades. I'm so thankful for driving instructors because I'm not teaching my children how to drive. I've been pondering this question, what does it look like? What would God say? What would a holy nation look like? And what would God say to Saskatchewan if he was here? Because we're reminded here at the end of Amos chapter 7, God takes holiness seriously. And in Israel's case, both Judah in the south and Israel, the nation in the north, God said, you're my covenant people, you know better, I'm holding you accountable. But we saw with Gaza and with Ammon and with, with the various different countries there's common things we should all know how to treat each other, and God holds us accountable for this. God is a holy God. What do we do with this? I want to suggest three, th sorry, four things before the worship team comes back to lead us in a closing song. First off, when God brings his punishment, when God brings the wrath, it's never on a whim. There's always a reason. There's always something driving it. And there's a fairly consistent message throughout Scripture. I've always warned you before it happens. We can't say to God, well, we didn't know any better. Well, we didn't know you didn't want us to do that. Any of you remember when you were a kid and you knew you were doing something wrong, but your parents hadn't expressly said that exact thing? Maybe it was your children doing this and you watched them do it. You're living vicariously through them. But I still remember that as a kid. Well, you didn't tell me I couldn't do that. I know full well I'm not supposed to do that. We know principles. Principle number one, God's punishment is always for a reason. Israel's actions and attitude have demanded a response from God, and the fact that God has delayed his response is because he's merciful, not because he's lazy or incapable. And God's mercy, don't, don't, don't miss this, God's mercy is there for our benefit, but never, never cheapen it. Never take it for granted. How many people put off? Oh, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'll, I'll make changes in my life tomorrow. I know, I know I'm not quite doing what I should to, but tomorrow. But we know what God is saying. God is holy and righteous with his punishment. Second thing, if we want to know what all of this looks like, just look at Amaziah and how he speaks to Amos and the condemnation then given to him. There's this really interesting, as I say, Amaziah really is standing in for all of Israel where he says, I don't want to listen to God. I want to do what I want to do. And there is actually this really interesting moment of mercy. And we'll talk about this in a few moments. But an interesting moment of mercy in the middle of saying, I am going to destroy you. And God does. Your wife, your children, your people, everything you know is gone. Amaziah 
stands in for the people of God and functions as a warning for us. Will we listen to the prophet of God? Will we listen to the counsel of God? Will we listen to the word of God? Third conclusion. The grace and mercy of God is there even when his wrath is present. And if you're following along in your bulletin, I'm switching three and four because four needs a little bit of explanation. The grace and mercy of God is hinted at in this text. First off, God says, I'm going to send the locusts, wipe them out. Amos intercedes, God relents. I'm going to send the fire, Amos intercedes, God relents. Even the fact that it's exile and not death hints that God maybe wants to spare them, wants to try and give them a little bit more time to repent. But his grace is not cheap. His mercy is not to be taken lightly. And we know from history, Israel doesn't repent. They go into captivity. We never see them again. They're gone. Interestingly, if we're going to talk about Judah, Babylonians come in. This is where we meet Daniel, Ezekiel. And they're in captivity for 70 years. And for 70 years, they cry out to God. Why are we here? And very early in their captivity, the people of God begin to realize we're here because we sinned. And men like Ezekiel begin to say, we're here because we sinned. And in those 70 years of captivity in Babylon, we begin to see a heart shift on the part of Judah. We don't see this with the northern tribes. When God comes, brings the Assyrians, they're gone, they never come back. No heart shift. With Judah, there's a heart shift. 70 years, they go home. After 70 years, they'll begin the rebuilding project. We read Ezra and Nehemiah. Do you know what never happens again in the history of Israel? They never fall back into idolatry. To this day. As a nation. I, I'm sure there are individuals who do. But as a nation, we don't see them chasing the bales. We don't see them worshiping false gods. They have a whole new set of problems in Jesus' day. We'll talk about that when we move back into Acts. We see this with the Sanhedrin, with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees and the scribes. But they begin to learn. Because God in his punishment is also actually changing them. And it's part of his grace and his mercy. The fourth thing I want us to consider is the model of intercession. I want to camp on this for just a moment. Intercession is this idea that we stand in the gap between God and man. In fact, there's a book called In the Gap. And there have been songs written about it. And this idea has been developed a little bit. And I don't have time to do a full kind of theological unpacking of this today, but I want us at least thinking about this idea. An intercessor is one who stands between God and man and pleads for them. We have some interesting examples of it. Amos intercedes. God says, I'm going to send fire. I'm going to send locusts. I'm going to wipe them out. Amos, in praying and begging for God's mercy, gets God to extend mercy because that's what an intercessor does. If you want a couple of other really interesting examples of intercessor, Moses. After the Israelites, they've been in the wilderness for a little while, Moses is up on the hill. And I, I allude to this story often because it's so pivotal in our understanding of so many things. He's up there, he's in the presence of God, and all of a sudden God one day says to him, um, go back to your people, they're in sin, uh, and I'm going to wipe them out now. And this is when Aaron and, and the leaders gathered all the gold and they made the golden calf. And Moses comes down and he smashes the tablets because he's so angry. And he asks his older brother, what did you do? And only an older brother would use the line Aaron did. Well, we put the gold in the fire and the calf came out. Yet yeah, no. And God at one point says to Moses, get out of my way. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to start again with you. And the model of intercession is seen when Moses pleads for Israel that God would relent and spare Israel. And God says, I'll start again with you. And Moses counters with, if necessary, blot my name out, but spare these people. And God relents. In fact, the first time someone does this, this is the first time someone's called a prophet. Because there's a connection between hearing from God and praying on behalf of others. The very first prophet is Abraham. In Genesis chapter 20, Abimelech, he lies about who Sarah is. Sarah's I think she's in her 80s by this point. He's still lying about who his wife is because she's so beautiful. Men want him dead so they can marry her. And God punishes Abimelech and the officials of the country. And God comes to Abimelech in a dream and says, ask Abraham to pray for you. Ask him to intercede for you. To stand between 
me and you, to plead your case because he's a prophet. See, when God reveals things to us, and sometimes we like to have prophetic voices in our world to say, here's what God would say to our country, and, and here's where we've fallen on our sin. Those are valid. God sends those prophets. But notice with Amos' example, with Moses' example, with Abraham's example, prophecy is linked to intercession. When God says, I'm coming to kill them, it breaks the heart of the prophet and brings a brokenness on the part of the prophet to plead for God's mercy. I'm fascinated by this. There's a place for the wrath of God. I love some of the Psalms where David says, choose between them and me. And he, he's asking God, wipe out my enemies. But there's other places. And we saw this with Stephen a few weeks ago because he intercedes. Do not hold their sin against them. That last intercession moment on the part of Stephen is fascinating because Saul is there guarding the cloaks of those who are killing Stephen. Stephen's asking the sins not held against them. And in a matter of a little bit of time, that same Saul is going to encounter the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. And I would argue part of that is in answer to, to the prayer of Stephen. Don't hold the sin. There is a call for us as a church. It's important that we stand up in society and say, this is wrong and proclaim truth. But we can't do it without begging for God's mercy. Now, we don't beg for God's mercy as if sin doesn't matter, but we beg for that transformation. We beg that the sin be addressed. We beg for broken hearts, and we beg for restoration of broken relationships, and we beg that the Spirit of God would move so that God doesn't have to punish them. We stand in the gap. Do we deserve wrath? Some of us do. Are we ignoring the voice of God? Maybe some of us are. Are we finding the mercy and grace of God even when we feel like, the, like life doesn't work? And I really want to challenge us in a, in a nation that is, we, I've heard people call us post-Christian. I'm not sure that's an accurate label. I'm not convinced Canada was nearly as Christian ever as we'd like to think it was. It founded on Christian principles. But as we identify the sin of our nation, will we plead with God to change hearts and transform lives to hold his wrath back? Worship team, would you come as we close in prayer? Holy God, we thank you for Amos and what you've said through him. The example of a man who sees you, who hears your voice, who intercedes on behalf of others. Lord, for those at home, those who are here, who are ignoring what you're saying, are ignoring the seriousness of their sin, would you bring conviction? Would you remind them that your wrath will be satisfied, your judgment is just, and your holiness will happen? And may they respond accordingly. And Lord, for those of us who are your children, walking in right relationship with you, Lord God, would you give us the courage to intercede on behalf of our nation? Would you guide us in what it looks like to intercede on behalf of our nation? Would you show us our sin, both as our community, of our church, of ourselves, those around us? Would you break our hearts for one another? And Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray as Stephen did, as Moses did, as Amos did. That your kingdom would be expanded and that your wrath would be turned away by the power of the cross because we share your grace and your mercy with others. I ask this in the name of Christ. Amen.
I'd like to leave you with the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May you be kept, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God bless you this week. We are concluded. <laughs>